Welcome to Cohn and Kruger. That's Larry Kruger. I'm Grant Cohn. We have breaking news from Ian Rappaport, who keeps jerking us around. Tell us what's going on. So originally he says, hey, don't be surprised if Sam Darnold starts week one. And it was like a big report. He, was, he really made a big deal about it. Then he just like goes on Pat McAfee's show. And then like while he's like yucking it up with the boys, he's like, oh, by the way, the Niners heard what I said, hit me up. And pushed back and said, why would you count out Trey Lance? Like, in passing. That's news, Ian. What do you think of Ian casually saying that the Niners actually went out of their way to be like, dude, why are you saying this? So then why is he so adamant that he's going to be traded if the team that would be trading him is pushing back on the notion of, you know, of of Sam Darnold being the guy? Why is... Why is uh, you know, Ian's so all in on Sam Darnold if the Niners aren't. Is he anymore? Like he has some splaining to do, Ian. Very and I think he knows it, and that's why he kind of tried to bury it mid, mid Ian Rappaport. You're like, no, do a segment on N- NFL network and explain what's going on. Yeah, why are you why have you been saying for months in very specific terms? With very like you know, sounding very confident that there is going to be a trade of Trey Lance if there's no source. That seems very bizarre. Very bizarre. Seems unprofessional. So explain that one. Don't just try to like laugh it off with Pat McAfee, who obviously isn't going to ask you a question because he's not a journalist. You got to answer this question. You're a journalist, Ian Rappaport. To me, what the way I interpret it is the Niners brought in Darnold. They like Darnold, and he's a nice fallback in case things fall apart with Trey Lance. But obviously, if they had their way, it would work out with Trey Lance. They're probably hoping plan A is that it works out with Trey Lance. Or obviously plan A is Brock Purdy comes back and he's healthy and you don't have to worry about anything else. Barring that, plan A is Trey Lance works out and and Sam Darnold is an intriguing plan B. I think that's the way they wanted it. And you got Ian Rapport, NFL Network, framing it the other way. And they're like, well, we don't want to raise expectations on Sam Darnold that much. It's Sam Darnold. Come on. So here's the question. Is Ian Rapport playing coy right now or is Ian Rapport out over his skis on this report and went with a dramatic a dramatic report about quarter a quarterback being traded and got very specific it's like he's not going to be traded now but he is going to be traded after they assess where Brock Purdy is and if Brock's healthy so it was very specific so we're supposed to believe that it didn't it wasn't a sourced deal you mean you're going with that level question. of That's a, a good rumor. question and it's, it's a good not question. sourced. It's just it would seem out of character it. for someone like him, right? So let, let me let me let me give an interpretation. Wow, we've talked about this before. Again, it's possible that <clears throat> the source could be, and I don't know. Let's say it's John Lynch, the initial source. He talks a lot. I mean, he's connected to all these people. What if then Kyle Shanahan calls up Ian Rappaport this week and is like, "What's going on?" And Ian's like, "Well, I was talking to John." And Kyle's like, "Well, John doesn't speak for me. I run this team." I mean, I don't know that that's happened, but I mean, that's the only way I could really ex- uh, explain away your questions. Other than maybe, I mean, he didn't. The one thing he didn't do today, Grant, is he didn't go and say, "Yeah, what I was reporting before was wrong." He didn't say that. In fact, when he was pushed on. Why, why did you report this? He was like, well, I mean, because Trey Lance hasn't shown me much. Yeah, but who are you? You're not yeah. a, you're not an evaluator. You're not a quarterback coach. You're not an offensive coordinator. You're not you're really not a head in the building. Coach. You're not a GM. You're not in the building. Yeah. So yeah. your sense of it. See, I don't, I don't buy it. I don't buy that yeah. Ian Rappaport thinks so much of his own, of his own opinion on players and how well they can play or can't play that he would put that out there just on his own thing i agree i agree with you i agree with you because that's something i would do that what i do is i I me you and i read the tea leaves and offer our opinions we make it very clear that we don't have sources that's not what ian's the source guy ian can call up seven people in the organization so what i'm thinking is either his source wasn't that good his source got overruled his source wasn't the number one person in the 49 because ultimately it comes down to kyle and I could see Kyle bringing in. Back, though did he walk it back? I didn't. I listened to the whole thing. I didn't he ever hear him. Grant walk it back to be like, you know what? He's probably not going to be dealt. He still sounded. He basically right. only talked about Brock Purdy and Sam Darnold in that report. Well, he's he's saying like, well, the Niners are pushing back, but I, you know, we'll, you know, we'll see what happens, kind of thing. But I, I just find it interesting that the Niners are basically saying, hey, he didn't hear this from us. 
He didn't hear this from us. And Ian's like, okay, well, we'll see if I'm wrong. I know. The other thing that was startling about that whole thing was they're sitting around talking about it. And between him, between McAfee, AJ Hawk, and Ian uh, Rappaport, you can tell none of the three believe in Trey Lance. Fair. I mean, didn't that sound they're not that in, way? again? They're, like, they're not there at practice, and they didn't that's fine. Seem like at all, like you know, yeah. like they're AJ like Hawk. You know, Trey Lance has got to show us something. Like, yeah, like this guy's been terrible. One guy says, "Well, it hasn't been that big of a sample size," but outside of that mention, it wasn't like it. Just when they were discussing who was going to start, it just didn't seem like they were really factoring in Trey Lance. And yet, well, I, he said he got pushback <laughs> from people in the building that he made it sound the way he made it sound. I don't really care what Pat McAfee and A.J. Hawk think about the Niners quarterback situation. What I do think is that what the Niners are doing is they eventually might want to trade Trey Lance. You know, let's say Brock Purdy comes back and is the guy they want. Maybe they want to trade Trey Lance. Talking up Sam Darnold doesn't help that. It doesn't. Maybe you want to trade one of the two of them if Brock Purdy comes back. Talking up Sam Darnold doesn't increase his trade value. But it does decrease Trey's because now everyone around the league is like, man, you really hate Trey, man. He's worse than Sam Darnold, huh? And you want me to give you a second round pick for this guy? No, he's worse. Than, you're telling me he's worse than Sam Darnold. So they have to walk that back. They have to be like, wait a second, Ian. Shut up. Well, we I mean, whispered that to you. That was a whisper. I mean, we could talk about that, but the, the real da damage that's been done to Trey Lance's value is the fact that the Niners don't seem to be talking him up, are talking up Sam Darnold, and then the two teams... Until today. That, well, until today. Until today. The two, the two teams, though, that needed quarterbacks who, quote-unquote, knew Trey, Rand Carthon and the Titans, went with Will Levis. Will Levis. And, you know, D'Amico and the Texans and the Niners South crew and in Houston, CJ went Stroud. with CJ Stroud, and so that speaks loud call. too. Good call. I think they both made the right call. Louder, right? Because I think they both made the right call. I mean, both Levis and Stroud have more experience than Lance, and they have they don't have serious injuries that they're coming back from, and they have the full the full rookie contract. And yeah, I, they don't have a, a surgically we'll repaired. I mean, ankle. it's all speculative, man. I I, I would Smart. rather have Trey Lance than those guys. Yeah, but. I, Sure, in a vacuum, but he's more expensive. He comes with an injury. He only has two years left on his deal. I mean, it's his contract is awful for, compared to Will Levis or C.J. Stroud. Actually, C.J. Stroud is pretty pretty. That's comparable. one way to look at it. That's one way. The other way to look at it is, you know what? There's a lot of bumps in the road to success, and he's already been on those, been already like down that. that road. And like Trey's, that. Trey's got a little bit more urgency, and I think he's probably a little bit closer to – you know, whatever he's going to be, we're going to see it, I think, right away. Where I don't know about Will Levis. I'm not sure about Stroud. Right. Fair enough. Also, if Brock doesn't come back right away, and this is really a competition between Trey and, and Darnold to start week one, it's Trey's competition to lose. If Sam Should is be. starting week one, it's probably because Trey played really bad in the offseason, not because Sam Darnold found this other gear that hasn't existed. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, Sam Darnold could probably be a little smarter turn the ball over a little less, but he's Sam Darnold. Trey's going to need to, this is his job. And if he plays like crap, then it won't be his job. I think that's, it's, it's, it's pretty much that simple. Unless Brock comes back and makes a miraculous recovery and really not up to anyone else. Yeah. I mean, if, if Brock comes back and they make him the starter immediately and he plays really well and takes off from what do we say, then, then it's a wrap, but that's a big if, right? That's I mean, a that's, a that's a huge if. if. And yeah. also I, 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 to me, um, I, I don't, I don't. I mean, I think Trey easily beats out Darnold if Me Trey too. has progressed at all. If he yeah. if he's progressed in this offense, he should beat out Sam Darnold. He really should. Even if he hasn't, Sam Darnold's a pretty low bar. So that if, so even if Trey Lance wins the job and starts Week One, he's still gonna have a lot to prove. Like beating out Sam Darnold doesn't mean he's made it. Is I guess what I'm trying to no. say. No, it really doesn't. I mean, it's points. Sam Darnold. They, this mm -hmm. I think that the Niners are gonna evaluate this on points. And the bar has been set high because Purdy was scoring 30 points a game. Now, mm -hmm. granted, he did it with McCaffrey. Trey didn't have McCaffrey, but Trey will right. have the full complement of weapons. And it's, it's really what it's going to take. It's just going to take leading the team down the field to points. Yeah, and absolutely. Wins. And staying healthy. Got to. We take healthy. that win for granted, but the Niners do too, and that's their problem. Frederick Peterson says Kyle and John are full of horse pucky. Simple as that. Horse manure, horse feathers. <laughs> At sign, dollar sign. 
Did you ever notice that? Did you ever notice that horse shit is way worse than bullshit? Like bullshit is like okay, I could take that, but someone says horse shit, I'm like, oh my god, you how could you say that? Horse shit? Horse shit? Really? Oh, I'll say I, this I, I, from see, jogging with my dad as a kid at the polo fields. You don't you you don't want to run through horse shit. I mean, you could trip on horse shit. I mean, it's horse shit feels like a baseball term. It's what it's, you say when you're mad at the at the umpire. That's it's all substantive. Yeah, it is. It's true. It's worse. It is worse. You could trip over a horseshoe. You could. Pile. You don't want to. Josh, Josh want Wyatt to. says, when that report came out, Lynch was confident that BP would be ready. Now that the doctors are slapping John down, he's desperately walking it back, trying to revive the Lance plan. Interesting. They keep talking about they won't really know what the deal is with Brock until 12 weeks out. I think that's like two weeks from now. So maybe this is the 49ers getting a little nervous at the at the deadline and thinking, hey, you know, Ian, stop creating false um, expectations for our fans because we don't even know what's going to happen. Or maybe they had some off. Maybe they thought they had an offer on you know for Trey in the draft, and now obviously the draft has come and gone. It didn't materialize. I mean, the I will say gone. this: I don't know why, but they did clear about ten million dollars of cap room going into mm -hmm. the draft, so they had the flexibility to pull the trigger on a trade. They may just not have gotten the. I mean, they right, and they haven't because they would need that. the cap space to trade them, right? Right. So I mean, right. I don't. So I don't understand. You know, they also so, need the cap space if Donald starts. Right, but they because he gets all kind of bonuses. To, but they didn't need to create it on draft weekend. So my point. my point is just yeah, that I think that you know maybe they were considering some options and those options obviously they were weren't there and so obviously now they, were. they want to kind of give you know the image the the image of hey you know what now there's going to be a competition and we'll see yeah. and i think they were the keeping their options open on Ayuk too which is why they picked up his fifth year option after the first round of the draft like that's not a coincidence to me right because they probably would have taken that 25th pick from the giants yes. at the end of the first round if the giants had offered it the giants probably didn't offer it probably didn't offer it anyway rookie mini camp is this friday it's a very interesting – it's the first time you get to see college players and Niners picked on the football field together. And I swear it is a moment of truth when you've been to a lot of these for us because it's one thing to watch them on YouTube, on college fields. It's hard. But when you see them in the NFL context in a field with all other NFL players and – where you can remember like what Dante Pettis looked on his first rookie mini camp, what Nick Bosa looked like in his ro first rookie mini camp. I mean, it's kind of it is a moment of truth. Who are you most interested to see? Your first impression of? Um, <laughs> I mean, a bunch of guys, but I'll I'll say this: the Niners have an undrafted kid out of North Dakota State named Spencer Wagey, who I did an interview with this week, and in doing the interview, I looked up every bit of info I could find. And what I found was this kid at 6'5 plus 300 pounds had a 166 10 yard split, the identical 10 yard split to Isaiah Foskey, uh, a better 10 yard split than Alden Smith had when he came out of, out of Missouri. And he's 300 pounds. The best defensive tackle 10 yard split in the draft was, uh, was Kalijah Cansey, who went in round one to Tampa. It was 164. He weighs Ooh. 280 pounds. This guy's wow. six five two three hundred, and he ran one six six. So I gotta see what Spencer Wagey, who says that he models his game after JJ Watt, does he look like JJ Watt? Because that one six six of three bills is cooked. He models his game after JJ Watt. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I go to the when I go to the gym and I work out, I'm thinking one day I'm gonna look like JJ Watt if I just keep Watt. going. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, the rookie I'm most intrigued to watch is, I mean, the guys in, in round three minus Moody. I, like, I'm actually going to be able to judge Jake Moody in a practice. Nah, I want to see J Jair Brown and Cam Latu, particularly Jair Brown. He, I want to see what he, he should be like the alpha of alphas on this field. They traded up for him. He's a third round pick. He should carry himself like he's the best player in the field. And then Cam Latu as well. Man, you are the number one. You're supposed to be the best offensive player on the field. Do you look like it? Do you look like it? I want to know. Yeah. Because Dante Pettis in his first rookie minicamp did not. And I wrote him off from that day forward. I'm sorry. It was just, it's like, dude, you're the second round pick here. And like, there are multiple undrafted free agents who are playing harder than you in this, on this day. Also, yeah, how, how seriously do you take the practice? It's, it's May. And well, it really I doesn't mean, matter. It's not, it's not about the but practice. I'm watching. It's about, yeah. it's about the movement and yeah. the conditioning. 
Are they in condition? How do they move? Sure. I'll give you one. How do they uh, compete? How do they compete? And just how do they look? I mean, we're, you and I, we're, we were at every mini camp, every training mm-hmm. camp. We're, we know what it's supposed to look like. At this yeah. point, we know what a premier linebacker looks like. So if we see D Winters and Jalen Graham and they're bouncing around the field and they look like they would belong on the field with Dre Greenlaw and Fred Warner and you see you know, last year Aziz, if they're in that caliber, and I think Marcelino McCrary balls in that caliber, you could see it right away. But if these guys are in that caliber, then it's like, wow, they really got something. I think I'm I'm eager to see those two guys too because um, I think both of them are terrific linebackers. The Niners are hitting on linebackers right now, and I think they hit on two more. Remember last year, our first impression of Drake Jackson? We both came back and we were like, huh, not the not the body I was expecting. Doesn't really have an NFL body yet. Little soft little, little like i bet you it's going to look a whole lot different this year it's what some of the pictures show that he's much more muscled up which, which is what you would expect um but we had that first impression of drake jackson last year yeah both of us yeah, yeah that he looked more like a like arden key a and less like d ford i like remember saying that and, to you yeah. i'm like man yep. grant i i thought this guy was gonna he was sold as like edge rusher speed and right. oh, he looks more like arden key like he could play tackle and sure enough they played him inside uh, late in the year in their four D yeah. end alignment, so you know that he was better right. r- rushing the interior. Also, I want to see also this Jordan. Kid be- I want to see Beal too because if you're a oh, four yeah. four kid who played at Georgia, um, you know you like? you might stand out on a on a yeah. field of athletes. A four sure. four defensive end who was a five star guy coming out of high school who played at Georgia might really stand out. I want to see who has the NFL body. Because a lot of college players get drafted and it's like, you need a year. You know, you just don't have it quite yet. I mean, Kittle was that way. Fred Warner was that way. But some guys come in and has have this NFL body already, like Jordan Mason. You could tell, and he wanted to show it off. He would, like, show off his midriff and stuff. He had this, like, 225-pound running back with a six-pack. It's like, where did you come from? Ty Davis Price doesn't look like that. So I want to see, like, which guys have NFL bodies right now. Like, Dante Pettis never had one. I don't think Elijah Mitchell really has ever had one, even though he's a hell of a player, but he does get hurt a lot, and that's part of the reason why. Who's really ready to play this man's game right now? Yeah, I mean, the other guy that I got, I mean, I'm be very interested to watch, is the YouTube sensation or the uh, Isaiah Twitter Winstead. sensation, Isaiah Winstead. Yeah. Simply because, I mean, dude's big. He, his movement ability in that video was legit, even though the four seven is the ruling stat, right? You, it, that right. tells us that he can't play four seven really should tell us that he can't play in the NFL. So I'm going in thinking he can't do it. But that being said, Juwan Jennings said, already defied those ex, those odds, right? So there's and, a path. And Winstead was the one thing that's just tells you that he can is the guy caught 88 passes this year for over a thousand yards, almost 1100 yards and like six or seven touchdowns. So for, and he did it for East Carolina. He didn't do it for UC Davis. I mean, he did it for East Carolina. So, um, I, to me, that's fired at UC Davis. (laughs) Well, I didn't do it at Sac state. I mean, he didn't do it. JT O'Sullivan. uh, Yeah. (laughs) Marte Mapu. Yeah. 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 I mean, East Carolina is is a that's a good league, you know. Yeah, they play good teams, and and yep. those stats of eighty eight catches mean something. And that workout film showed unbelievable stop and start quickness at that size, and somehow he caught all those balls. So I want to see what that guy looks like against NFL caliber corners. Also, the, the way I look at it is, I feel like Kyle, unless he can find George Kittle, he's just going to turn George Kittle into two players. You know, a really good blocker. And a big slot receiver who runs like a tight end, but is a better out runner. I mean, I think Jawan Jennings is essentially a tight end on this team. Um, you could put him in the slot. You could call him a slot receiver. But the routes he runs, it's probably the routes that Jordan Reed ran when he was on the field on third down four, three, yeah. three years ago. Pretty much the same. So, yeah. you know, um, a seven and, yard and, choice uh, route. And Latu, by the way, you mentioned Latu. You, you saw the the Barrows piece with McLuhan where McLuhan called him a second round pick and was said that he's really special, even brought up the name Tony Gonzalez and said that this kid looks like he's got a basketball player's build and game and movement ability. They said the same thing about Pettis, which sometimes is like a coverall to like, I know his 40 times stinks. I know, you know, I know his workout stink, but man, the guy is a basketball player. That's like a coverall for, yeah, trust me, trust me. He's going to be good. But um, I'm interested to see the two and, and whether he's, you know, got that fluidity that maybe because I mean, let's be honest, it's Kittle 
and then open real estate. I mean, that those jobs, whether it's Latu, Werner, Dwelly, Fumagalli, who they signed today, Bray, it's all, all these guys are, to me, it's Kittle and no, but no other job is set. Yeah, I mean, if he's Tony Gonzalez, Tony Gonzalez is one of the greatest of tight ends ever. I'm looking at, am I wrong? What what was Tony Gonzalez's 40 time? Was it, was it really slow? I'm seeing 4 what? 8 3. That can't be right. Was he really that slow? Well, yeah, I think so. But his vertical wow. was great. What was it? Did it say okay. vertical? Didn't he have like a nah. 38 inch vertical? Maybe he did. Maybe he did. Hey, I, I kind of been down on Latu. I feel like he's just not fast enough. But maybe that's the comparison there. Tony Gonzalez. Wow. Oh, that would be. I mean, if the guy's Tony else. Gonzalez, then John Lynch is executive of the year. Tony Gonzalez. When was he drafted? Uh, years ago. Let me see. Uh, no, I mean like when in the draft. He was the he was the first round pick in oh, the draft. First round. He was the thirteenth. I I don't think so. I call BS right here. There's no way. But hey, thanks McLuhan. I appreciate it. I'm. I, he gave me some time one time. A very. He gave me like a half hour in a one on one interview, and I asked him about. So I'm not gonna. He knows more than me. It's his four eight three, and only a thirty three inch vertical. That doesn't sound right at all. How was how was he the thirteenth pick in the draft running a four eight three? I I call BS. I like how the a tight end. No, I'd love to know. So if anyone in the chat wants to educate us on, <laughs> he was good. Tony I, I will say this. combine I mean, I numbers. Saw, he was good at Cal as a basketball player too. Oh, yeah, he was. I remember that. All right, let's talk defense. So, Javon Hargrave is in. That's eleven sacks. But out the door goes Samson Ebukam. Jordan Willis and Charles Amenehu. That's 11 and a half sacks. It's a little bit of a wash. So for the Niners def off, uh, pass rush to really take a, a step, I think it's going to involve some scheme that they didn't show the last couple of years under D'Amico Ryans. No disrespect. Steve Wilkes is a big-time blitzer. They brought in Jair Brown, who's a big-time blitzer. I think we're going to see some exotic pressure packages which should be good for the defense what are you expecting well i mean it, it would be a great thing to see why because all the niner linebackers run four five so yeah d winters is a delayed blitzer fred warner on delayed blitzes greenlaw on delayed blitzes you know yeah uh F flanagan fouls i mean these guys all can play v really really fast it's really a collection of guys who almost all of them play db so um it's a it's a fast, you know, fast linebacker group where you could have these delayed blitzes. Um, it just also puts a lot of pressure on Drake Jackson. I mean, is if Drake Jackson is worlds better, then that's one thing. But man, I I, I personally think this is if you said what do the Niners really need, I think they need one more one more edge piece. I really do. I and I I I don't know if they'll get it. I don't know if they're in the market for it, but I think they need it. I I, I don't. They lost 750 snaps of e of Emma uh, Menahue and Ebukam and uh, Willis, and those guys were all better than mm -hmm. Cleveland Farrell and Austin Bryant. And I love Robert Beal's profile as an athlete, but it's a little bit of a projection. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I mean, he didn't he led the team in sacks two years ago, but you know, it's a little bit of a projection. And I just think that they that I mean, think about it this way. If all of a sudden Nick Bosa had a hamstring injury and he was going to miss three or four weeks, be they trouble. would be in a bind, man. Be they would be in a major bind. So I, I think they need one more edge piece. I, oh Yeah, absolutely. But I don't think they also need a right tackle. But I don't think they're going to get these guys at this point. And I think what's interesting is instead of getting that edge piece, which is probably a first round pick, kind of like the right tackle, they traded up for a safety who blitzes and had four and a half sacks last year at Penn State. I think that's very interesting. I feel like on third down, when you get all those exotic fronts and your defense is so much different than first and second down, they could find all kind of packages with Jair Brown on the field where he's blitzing. And that could be, you know, manufacturing that edge rush that doesn't exist. If Steve Wilkes is good, that could be his. That could be he works. That could be how he works around a personnel deficit. I think Isaiah Oliver blit, blitzing out of the slot. I could see that. I could see that. Quite Even a bit. Talanoa. Yeah, Talanoa loves to play. You know, loves to come forward for sure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, that's that that that's easy to envision for sure. That they're gonna. I mean, I don't, I haven't seen tons of Hartsfield, but I could see him as a nickelbacker. You know, coming. There, there's one trait that does stand out against Wilkes versus D'Amico is Wilkes is going to play. He's going to blitz more and he's going to rely more on cover three. If 
what he's done elsewhere carries over. If he does what he did in other spots here, they're going to play a lot more cover three than, than varied coverages, and he's going to blitz more often. Yeah, I mean, I'll probably do a lot of zone on first and second down, but I'm guessing on third down we're going to see some man coverage because they're going to blitz. Uh, if you want to bring five, you probably got to play man-to-man coverage behind it. And what Salah had really good pressure packages on third down. What he used to do, he would put Buckner in the A-gap, which kind of sacrificed him, which was why his sack numbers weren't always that high. But if you put Buckner in the A-gap, then you know which way the center's going to slide. Then you can bring pressure off the other edge and get unblocked rushers. And you always see him do that with like K1 Williams or Dre Greenlaw, Quan Alexander. He was really good at it. D'Amico didn't really do that kind of stuff. He didn't have really sophisticated pressure schemes. I think Wilkes will. And I think that's going to help this defense, especially in the playoffs when you face teams who are just as talented as you. What's really going to help Wilkes in the playoffs is all four of his defensive linemen can rush the passer. I mean, you're not going to be leaning right. on Javon Kinlaw. You're you're not right. as a right. starter. Hargrave is a outstanding interior pass rusher. So I mean, you're talking about a guy yeah, with double is. digit sacks, and and uh, I think you're going to see all kinds of games up front. I think you're going to see you know stunting and twisting and Hargrave, Armstead, Givens, Kalia Davis. I think could make an impact as a rusher. Um, so that it's going to be really interesting to see how the D tackle minutes get or, or not minutes, but reps get divvied up because you know, Hargrave and Armstead are your ones, but Givens is Givens can play in a rotation. I think Kalia mm-hmm. probably can um, same with McGill and we'll see what and you want a rotation. Guy. Like the Eagles have a road. They're all better if they're in a rotation. It's good. Yeah. Oh yeah. You need, yeah. I mean, especially the Niners, they love the, 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 the depth of their front. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I mean, but who gets the lion's share of the snaps behind the ones? I think that's going to be interesting. And also, you know, is Jay, is Drake ready to to be the starter opposite Bosa uh, and everything that comes with that? You know, so that that's going to be, you know, can he man up and play more snaps than he did? Last year he played in a rotation and he was inactive like the last four or five games. You know, can he, I don't know what kind of offseason it's been. To me, that's a big question. I'm really curious to see what his third down defense looks like. With D'Amico, it was a lot of three by one uh, on the defensive line, right? Like three guys on one side of the center, one guy on the edge, and they would have some kind of a game, some kind and, of. A and twist. it was a great way. To, and sometimes guys that was would pretty just, much what they would do. Yeah. yeah, and sometimes one of those guys would, you know, kind of be the sacrificial lamb. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna. Yeah. I'm gonna. A gap control rushers. Guys, yeah, right? exactly. And then yep. you're gonna come flying around, and I'm gonna rush at such an angle. That you're going to dovetail right off my back, and you're just going to have a runway to the quarterback. See, I mean, they I, did I thought a, they envisioned they that job. for. I mean, they did a great job with it, really. I agree. I thought they envisioned that more for Drake Jackson. Like on third down, you're going to be one of those interior guys on in that three side, and I, I maybe you could be a D end, you know, on first down like Charles Amenahue, but on third down, you're going to be in, inside. That's the way I thought, but I guess not. I guess they changed their mind and they're getting a shot in the edge. Oh, what? choice do they have at this point it's either him or robert peel or austin bryant or excuse me cleveland farrell who would you take off the see the thing is last year you could take kinlaw or you know take a right. run stuff guy off the field put drake yeah. inside or a menahue inside and then play kind of games up front not hargrave all, all kinds of movement now you you know who you're not taking not hargrave off the field you're probably not taking eric off the field probably so not, not for clearly, what you're paying him yeah so i mean those guys <laughs> no. are play. So yeah. that you don't you need Drake to be more of an edge yeah. rusher this year and play less inside. I would agree. I would agree. Uh if you look at the Niners defensive rookies, Jair Brown, Darrell Luter Jr., D winners, on and on, even the undrafted free agents, they all have something in common with each other and all have something kind of different that sets them apart from the DBs the Niners were drafting and signing forever until like last year when they got Talanoa Hafunga. Now, all of a sudden, it seems like every DB they have has, what is it called? Ball skills. Ball skills. They can catch the football. Interception production. Yes. It's important. Guys who sack the quarterback, sack the quarterback. Guys who pick the ball off, pick the ball off. And that's what they got. Yeah, I mean, I, I was reading about this this morning. Somebody put this out as far as the interception totals on these rookies. And if you look at it side by side, man, it's a hell of a point. 
Jair Brown, 10 picks in the last two seasons. Luter, 10 picks. D. Winters, three. Graham had three. Jameson, really underrated player out of Texas, six. Avery okay. Young had three. And okay. it just kind of shows this shift in Niner, Niner philosophy. They used to go with, you know, let's run and hit and be the and have these monsters who separate you from the football and yeah. we'll just we'll just crush you. And you but now that plays a penalty. So it's now it's like that's not a good game plan anymore. And they've subtly shifted away from Tart, away from Jimmy Ward. And now yeah. here's a Fonga and he picks the right. ball off. And here's Gibson, right. who coming into last year, I think had 27 or 28 that's career right. picks and then wound up with a bunch, right? What did that's right. Gibson wound what up he does. with four or five? This is, it, it, he didn't have like an aberration season. This is what he does. But he Absolutely. does. He gets five or yeah. six picks a year. So he does. Um, so that's kind of what that's the emphasis. But then and then these this draft, they went with a lot of guys with interception production. And I just think that, you know, they're gonna they got two 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 game plans. You got your gut your front four and what you're doing to dial up pressure. And the Niners try to get it done with four more times than not. And then it's about D'Amico did. It's about can you can your guys in the back seven take the ball yeah. away? I mean, it's nice to get a big hit, but a big hit in today's game, it's 50-50, a 15-yard penalty, Agreed. as opposed to a hit and a fumble and a turnover. It could be a big play for the other team. But if you have linebackers and safeties and corners that have great ball skills and they can take the ball away and you get five or six more interceptions, Niners led the league in picks last year. They'll probably be among right. the league leaders this year. It's probably It wasn't like that for a while. I think the year before oh. they were like 19th. I, they they like didn't really get it. Thing, didn't they? Yeah. One, one year they had like two or three picks. Like from their secondary. I mean, it was really also, bad. If you're really invested in pass rush, then what complements it is DBs who can pick the ball off because the, the quarterback's going to be under pressure. He's going to be throwing while taking hits. He's going to be throwing, you know, early. And you want guys who can jump on passes, be instinctual, and pick it off, not just guys who can rally to the ball and, and sack the, not sack, uh, tackle the uh, receiver. You could do better. Aim higher. It's a bigger play. It's a much it a bigger, bigger play. play. It's kind of yeah. like, um, why I love that kid, Will McDonald, who went to the Jets, and why I love D. Ford when he was here. These guys mm. don't just sack the quarterback. They're the kings of sack and strip. Got it. And I think Robert McDonald Sala had like 10 forced fumbles. That's a Robert huge Sala. Thing. Yeah. I mean, it's a, <laughs> Shout out Sala. It's, it's a technique thing. It's like you got to sack the quarterback. you got to punch that ball out. And if you can get the, the strap, the, the sack strip, you know, change of possession, it's one of the biggest plays in football. Right. And, and to your point, you said earlier, like, uh, people who sack the quarterback, sack the quarterback. It's not something necessarily you can just teach a good athlete to do. The Niners are going to try with Robert Beal. He's a really good athlete. But some of these guys, it does, I mean, what did Terrell Suggs, Terrell Suggs ran like a 4-9? He was just a great edge rusher. People yeah. freaked out about what he ran, and then he went to the NFL, and his production from college carried over because he was a great edge rusher. Terrell Suggs. Yeah, or like Elvis yeah. Doomerville. Remember Elvis Correct. Doomerville? He yeah, another short. Raven. He was, you know, played at Louisville, middle Louisville. around, but he sacked the quarterback a ton at Louisville. And then he comes in the NFL. What do he do? He sacked the quarterback again, you know, on a, on a, you know, at a high rate. So, yeah. I got another example. Who do Javon you Hargrave. Exactly. Javon, Javon Hargrave. State. Hell yeah. Sacked the quarterback. I mean, a little too small, didn't I? Whatever. It sacks the quarterbacks. Keep sacking the quarterback. Yep. Absolutely. Sacked and that's why that, that's why when they take a guy like Javon Kinlaw in the first round, or when the Eagles take a guy like Jalen Carter, I'm like, yeah, he's a great athlete, huh? Great athlete. Where's the production? He couldn't sack the quarterback in college. You're telling me he's going to sack the quarterback in, in the NFL? Maybe I'm sure there's examples, but that seems like you know the exception of the rule. I wouldn't bet on that in round one. I want if I'm getting a pass rusher, I'm getting a pass rusher, not an athlete. That's all, that's yeah. all I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, and and it just, I mean, the Jalen Carter thing. I mean, he would have gone first in the draft if he hadn't, if he'd shown up at the workouts in shape. Said he was out of shape. He was fifteen pounds overweight. He's got he's got some kind of issues with his vehicle where he's had all kinds of issues. I mean, he's he's got to grow up, mature, right. and the Eagles are gambling that Fletcher Cox and right. and uh, Brandon Graham. Right. can take that kid in their culture and they're going to get it out of them. But it's a big risk. It's a big it is a big risk. risk. It is a big risk. I, but it seems like they're a team that might be able to pull it off if anyone can. Corey Soto says, real question, Larry, if Purdy comes out and is never the player we're projecting him to be, how does that change you as a pundit and football student? <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> Jeez. <laughs> That's like a lot of hypotheticals there down the line. <laughs> If Purdy comes out and is never the player we're projecting him to be, I guess it would be because of the elbow. 
The only, I mean, Brock Purdy's not going to forget how to play quarterback, but you're right. He could come out after that elbow surgery, and there's some percentage chance that he either loses accuracy or zip on the ball. And if he loses accuracy and zip on the ball, he ain't going to be the same guy. He so, also could lose confidence for a while. He could lose timing if he doesn't have an offseason. There are things, but th- those things should be uh, temporary. Well, he I'm talking about for, he could be forever diminished, though. I mean, like, forever. let's be That's honest. True. I mean, he, his arm, could his be arm was toast. torqued and it was his throwing arm. And who knows how those ligaments heal and who knows what kind of touch he has. And it's all but he's not going to lose his brain and he's not going to lose that part of it. But he could lose zip. And he didn't. And let's be honest. Brock didn't have zip to lose. So if Correct. he loses a lot of zip, that's going to be a bad. That's like a fastball pitcher throwing 95 and all of a sudden he's throwing 90. It, it, it will matter. So although in Purdy's case, it was more like it's more like a guy who was throwing 90 who's now throwing 85. Theoretically, I'm not saying right. he's Barry Zito yet. I'm not calling him Barry right. Zito. Remember when Barry Zito used to throw 84 mile an hour fastballs in real MLB games? That was wild, Larry. While making $26 million a year. That was why he really did that. But as far as changing me as a pundit, I don't, it will not change me. I will be the same. You I will always get credit for, for seeing what no one else saw. I, even the Niners didn't see what you saw. You said it with your chest when they wouldn't, and I respect but that But they forever. said it by drafting him. You they said it. Him. They did They're the ones him. who picked call. him. That's a good call. Right. Fan says, what happened to the Banana Hands grant? Oh, it's, it's still around. Don't worry. I have the Banana Hands uh, oven mitts. They're upstairs, and I break them out when it's important. Or he only played eight games and defense has learned, says Corey Soto. See, that's the thing. Like with Lance, he had that great year at North Dakota State, came back for one game the next year. It didn't go so well. And then he shut it down. And people were like, well, what about that one game? What was that? And that's a good point. And with Purdy, before he got hurt, there was that one game against Dallas, which really did have a legit defense. And it was just very hard for the entire offense, 19 points. It's like, what was that? Was that just a great defense? Or did Dan Quinn see something? I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. I think it was a little bit of Kyle, to be completely honest. I thought Kyle, I thought that was Kyle's most conservative game plan by far all year. Mm-hmm. He did not take any chances in that game. He gave Dallas way, way more. That's what he should have done in the NFC Championship game. Yeah. Can I just well, say he should have been a little bit more conservative in the NFC Championship game? But yeah. I mean, think about that. Think about how um how how he went for it with Josh Johnson at the end mm-hmm. of the first half against Philly. Compare that to the way he called Correct. the game in the first half with Purdy against Dallas. I mean, it's amazing. It, it Really, it's amazing it's the same play caller. He had a lot of respect for Dan Quinn and Micah Parsons. He clearly had no respect for Hassan Reddick and Robert Gammon, Gannon. And you know what? I get not respecting Robert Gannon. That guy is terrible. And he was exposed two weeks later. But Hassan Reddick, whoo, you were wrong. Your evaluation of Hassan Reddick apparently was wrong, Kyle. Apologize to Hassan right now. Well, what I what I noticed there, and I don't know, I'd love to talk to Kyle about it. It's like if you played the Eagles again today, would you recognize the fact that the Eagles are not really honoring the play fakes in the play action game and Thank not you. go play action? Thank because you. if you if the defense is not going to honor the play fake at all, the play action only hurts you. Agree. Also, to me, there's no there's no shame in losing. There's nothing. If you lose, if you learn from your mistake, if you learn from your mistake, then that could be the, mo- the, the most important loss of your life. The Chiefs lo- learned from their mistake in the Super Bowl against the Bucks and never put themselves in that position again with their offensive line. The Niners lose and they're like, ah, oh, it wasn't our fault. Ah, it was bad luck. It's like, ah, you got to learn from off. your, be Damn honest that, with off. yourself. It's all it's okay. Off. You know, yeah, no, yeah. It, we, we would respect you for saying, you know what, we weren't good enough this year. We thought we were, but we weren't. And and that's going to push us even harder. Like, that's the kind of mindset that I think people thought Michael Jordan had that resonates with them. Like, you're brutally honest with yourself. You hold yourself to the highest standard. You push yourself until you get there. That's what everyone loves about Jordan, right? That's the myth of Jordan. You guys are okay with being third place, and it's not cute anymore. It's been like four years. Push yourselves harder. Have a higher standard, please. Please. Well, I mean, just... Scout Philly better. Yes. And and I mean, and not that they didn't yes. have a good plan against Philly, but play action is what the Niners do. But play action, Philly had an awesome numbers against right. the play action. Correct. Well, why was that? Well, you could quickly see that their edge rushers, really their entire D line, not one of them was reading the play action fake. The mm-hmm. play action fakes did not ever slow them down. 
If, nope. if anything, it just took the offense an extra tick to carry cool. out the fake, and then boom. That's how they led the league with 70 sacks. That's right. And to me, so you couldn't have, you had to attack differently. And I don't think they adjusted the way I wanted to see them adjust. Or if they had, we didn't get deep enough into the game to see it. Yeah, the, the Niners didn't need to do seven step play action drops from under center to beat Philly. They really didn't. What they needed to do was not do that. Run the ball. Run the ball. Uh, looking at the 49ers salary cap hits next year. There are like nine players who are going to be making at least $14 million. That's a whole lot of your upper 1% players on your team, which is obviously going to come at the expense of your depth. Uh, do you feel like this is, given what's on the horizon for the 49ers in 2024, that this is a bit of a make or break year for the team? Well, you know, I, I just think it's a make or break year because – because it's a make or break year, they know that their window is closing. Even though they're they they've put up they've had good rosters and they're going to continue to have good rosters. But as far as will Trent they Williams. ever have a roster in the future yeah. in the ever, but in the next five years, as talented as this one, unlikely. I mean, you got a lot of players who are due to make a lot of cash next yeah. year. So I just think it's they're always kind of Super Bowl or bust because that's the 49er way at this point. Um, but you know, th this year I think is more Super Bowl or bust than any year of this regime because of that mountain of contracts that all have big cap numbers for 2024. They got to get it done. They got to get it done. This is the this this is probably the last best chance for Trent Williams to win a ring. This yeah. is probably the 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 could be the career year for George Kittle. Kittle. I mean, they're aligned. Armstead. Armstead. I mean, Arm Armstead already could be past guys. his prime. We don't even know. Like, we're we're banking on a bounce back season for Armstead, and he probably will have one. But this this could be it right now. So this is all. At Hargrave is thirty. This is such an important year for the 49ers. They do have a younger core, but they have a very significant, large, expensive older core that you can't take for granted. It's year to year with them. No doubt, and and not all these guys are going to be on Use the team check. next year. Hughes check. I mean, even even Debo. I mean, how much mileage does Debo really have? How many good years of Debo do you think you really have? Two, three? No, it's not a know. lot. It's 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 a low number. He's he's got yeah. a twenty eight million dollar cap hit next year. Mm -hmm. That's big. That's true. So they're 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 always in a go for it mode, right? You know, and they've been in this kind of Super Bowl mode of got to get the six, got to get the sixth. Though I did see somebody tweeted out that they did get, already get the sixth. Uh, I don't know who tweeted that. Uh, <laughs> the Did you day. see? They were celebrating in Miami. They were I was celebrating there. Celebrating in Miami. The whole yeah. team on the field. There was like yeah. six minutes left. I didn't see the rest of the game, but I'm pretty sure they won. Uh, yeah, they were up big. Yeah. They should have won. They were up big. Um, yeah, ten yeah. points. Yeah, I mean, and the other team had Mahomes, but what difference does that make? Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I mean, this is it. This is it. I mean, I'm not saying that they're going to be bad next year because you know the way the cap works. If it didn't work out for them this year, they could keep kicking that can down the yeah. road by one year and keep kind of reshuffling everything. But as you reshuffle your, that mountain of money grows bigger, the, you know, if the cap goes up exponentially, then maybe you don't feel it. But if it goes up slowly, you do feel it either way. They're loaded. They're in their window. Now's the time. The NFC is growing up quietly behind them, but right now it's Niners against the Eagles. And if the Eagles have any kind of Super Bowl, you know, um, you know, Super Bowl hangover of any kind, the 49ers could be the 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 dominant team in the NFC this year. If it's not Philly, it's the Niners. Those to me, those teams are to me right right there, and everybody mm -hmm. else is beneath. So I, I I think Detroit, Chicago, some of these teams are coming, but it's they're coming Seattle's in a year. Seattle's one I'm interested. In. Seattle's one I'm interested in because Philly Philly Seattle, took that leap maybe. from Philly took the leap from nine and eight to what was it fourteen and three. So yeah. it can be done. And I don't know. Seattle's a very young team, and it's Geno. But I, I, is Geno going to some... win the Super Bowl? Is Geno going to the Super Bowl? I don't think so. I, I mean, I like Geno. It's a nice I think story. Not, I, I think, think Seahawks Gino's fans would, would say the same thing with the same tone of their voice about Brock. <laughs> about Brock. I think they. I think they might. Is but that's Brock going to the Super Bowl? You really go with Brock, bro? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. All right. Nick Saban said something very interesting about. The nature of football and offense and defense is a defensive coach. I want to run it by you because I think it has implications with how the Niners build their team. 
This was Nick Saban uh, on the evolution of modern offense. It used to be that good defense beats good offense. Good defense doesn't beat good offense anymore. It used to be if you had a good defense, other people weren't going to score. I'm telling you, it ain't that way anymore. And if you think about it, Alabama has been very successful for a very long time, but they were used, used to be the kind of team that they were winning with defense, run game, skill players, and a quarterback named Greg McElroy or A.J. McCarron or Blake Sims or Jake Coker. Oh, Brody Croyle or somebody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the last four or five years, they've become a quarterback factory, one after another after another. And now four of the 32 starting quarterbacks in the league come from Alabama. He ain't lying. He understands this is an offensive game now and i think it's very interesting that defensive coaches are having this epiphany while the niners are over here the throwback team taking it back to 1998 i think it's interesting man what do you think well it is interesting it's interesting on a lot of fronts it has a lot to do with officiating now yeah. the monster hits a penalty it used to separate the ball you know the receiver from the football now if you have a huge hit they're literally they're, yeah i mean they're literally Targeting. officiating the impact yeah. So yep. if you have a big hit and the bigger hitters that you have, the more penalties that are coming Ejected. your way. That's it could be an ejection in college football. Yeah. You can't hit the quarterback except in the strike zone. So you can't yeah. hit him in the head. You can't hit him low. So you got to literally hit him between like the mid thigh and the mid chest. And if you hit him, you can't really land on him with anyway, your weight. Can't land on him. I mean, it's just, so there's, there's, there's rules been placed that take away uh, the impact defensive back. There's rules in place that take away the impact rusher. And now you've got these quarterbacks and the spread offenses are so prevalent. Quarterbacks mm -hmm. can just drop three steps and get the ball out. So mm -hmm. I've been asking this question for the last three or four years. Why prioritize and put so much money into your D-line when Tom Brady last year at 46 rolled into Levi's yep. and right. never was sacked the entire game because the ball That's just right. came out? Now, he didn't win. But the ball came out, and you didn't sack yep. the quarterback. And it's like, right. man, he really neutralized your entire roster and all the money you spent just mm -hmm. by getting the ball out quick. So and you now, can do it all day. Now I think ultimately the only way you can defeat the Mahomeses of the world is to have Offense. impact defensive players on all three levels of your defense. There's no, there's no shortcuts. There's no, there's no quick fixes. You, you need turnovers be, on defense. You need, you need interceptions. But possessions. you need to, you need to somehow just play pass coverage yeah. really tight. It's um, now it's about your back seven, not your front seven. It's not about right. stopping the run. It's about your back seven because those guys play 100 percent of the snaps, intercept the ball, and and your your front four. That's a rotation of guys. I mean, that's why I think the Niners are still a little stuck in the past. Like D lineman, yeah, it's really important, but you can get eight of those guys and play them third of the time. Like those guys in the back seven are your defense, and they're getting it. Like they they have the linebackers, they're getting the DBs too. Copy John Schneider. I hate to say it because he's uh, in a rival, but the GM of the Seahawks is building they from know. the back to the front. Smart. Devin Witherspoon, I thought was the best pick in the entire draft on defense. I mean, he's just total monster, um, and he's a corner. And then they've got Tariq Woolen and Kobe Bryant, and they, you know, they're trying to recreate the Legion of Boom. But I, I agree with the way they're building. I mean, they're building with impact guys on the back backside. What I want to say this, uh, how it ties into Kyle and the Niners' offense is. For the longest time, Nick Saban's attitude was, I need the best everything, but I can just get by. I can win championships with just a steady Eddie at quarterback. Not anymore. Now he's like, I need the number one quarterback recruit in the country. Come to Alabama. And he's getting them, and he's producing them in the NBA, NFL stars. Kyle, I don't know if he's there yet. I think he still kind of feels like, man, just give me Greg McElroy, and I'll win the whole freaking thing. You know what I mean? And I, to me, it's I'm not saying Brock Purdy's Greg McElroy, but... I think Kyle's a little too in love with his backup quarterbacks when he needs to shoot for the stars like Nick Saban. And he tried for a second with Trey Lance. It just was so uncomfortable for him. I think he got scared and went back to his comfort zone. You know, is Brock? who's more like Bryce Young, Brock Purdy or Trey Lance? I'd probably claim it's Brock Purdy. When I think of Brock Purdy, I think of Stetson Bennett. But Stetson Bennett got picked in like the fourth or fifth round. I mean, the Rams think he's good, so we'll see. I don't know. Maybe What Stetson makes Bryce Bryce and what makes Brock Brock, I think, is the processing. Those guys process what they're seeing at the line of scrimmage, and they have the quickness to move around the pocket. We'll True. see. I don't even know exactly. I think Bryce Trey has Lance a little bit more of a, a an arm than, than Brock, but maybe not. You think even Bryce has a better arm? Yeah, I think so. He's a he small down guy, though. Man. He is a really small. Man. He's hella small. 
He's hella small. And he's thin too. But he's kind of terrifying. What I love about him is that he keeps his eyes uh, you know, peeled downfield. He's like stepping up. He's moving around. He's yep. incredibly accurate. But Poise, so, confident. Know, Stroud was incredibly accurate too. Some of those and throws bigger. he made were crazy. Yeah, absolutely. Anyway, if Saban's having this epiphany, um, if the Seahawks are kind of having this epiphany, I mean, they're much more of an offensive team than a defensive team at this point. John, Kyle, you might just want to have a conference. You know, go to lunch, go to Jimmy John's, get a sandwich and talk about maybe fo focusing a little bit more on offensive line and quarterback. Because really, we just talked about how it's almost fruitless to go after the quarterback because all the rules protect him, and yet your team went through four quarterbacks last year. Like, that's amazing kind of given the context of where football is today. It shouldn't happen to any team, but it's happening to your team. Why? Nick Saban would like to know. And me too. And Larry, we were talking about it. The other uh, criticism, by the way, that, that we should probably, you know, it's it's a harsh criticism if yes. you really think about it, was Debo's line where we, this week, when he got a lot of wrath from Eagles fans by saying we played with 10 guys. How do you, how do you, guys. How do you look Josh Johnson in the face after you come up with that quote? Why do you need to say stuff like that? Why do you that, need, why do you need to put Josh Johnson down? Why do you need to make an excuse? Just say we lost, we got our asses kicked. It still stings. It's not going to happen again. I mean, isn't that? I don't know. That's I mean, what, just say what, you do. what I would say what you is do. like, hey man, we ran out of dudes. Congrats, yeah. congrats, yeah. you guys won. We ran out of dudes. We'll see next year. That's yeah. it. That's we'll it. See you next year. To, you don't have to be we'll like, next hey year. man, <laughs> we had ten. You had eleven. It's like, oh man. Because when you keep awesome. talking about like why you should have won and why it wasn't fair, it makes it makes me question your confidence that you're ever gonna beat him. It makes me feel like what you're saying was, man, that was our shot. That was our team. Our team was super good. We could have beat him. But now nah, I don't know. I mean, Jimmy's gone. It's like, where's the confidence? Your your attitude should be, they stole it from us. It was, it was a BS game. I can't wait to play him next. I can't wait yeah, to I mean, show just, him. Just you keep talking about the past. Just credit. Keep talking them. about it. Just credit, credit them. Them. the way he yeah. said that, I was like, wow, man. Uh, that's that's harsh. Yeah, all day, every day, Kim. Not just some of the time, Kim. All day, every day, Kim says, can't believe Sam will get his nine millionth chance to start and people have the nerve to complain about Trey in four games. Hey, well, according to Ian Rappaport, the Niners are like, hey, chill with that. Pump the brakes on the Sam Darnold revival tour, which is, you know, kind of nice. It feels like Sam Darnold is the nice plan B to me. It's a great well, just backup. I would just say to everybody, don't fear competition, right? I mean, also good call. You know, I mean, good there's call. no such thing as the uncontested quarterback. It's a right. contested position. It's like, are you not going to apply right. to UCLA because your major's impacted? No, you're still going to fucking apply. And if yeah. you get in, you get in. And if you don't, yeah. you don't. You don't sit there and go, ah, you know what? I'm not going to be a history major at UCLA anymore because lots of other True. people want to be history majors at UCLA, right? I mean, right. Just, That's a good point. And also what the Niners could be saying is like, look, like, yeah, we like Sam, but like, Ian, it seems like you're trying to read the tea leaves here and like, we're trying to have a quarterback competition. We don't know. We're actually going to have a quarterback competition. You could try to predict who's going to win, but like, that's just your prediction. Why would you count out Trey? We're not counting out Trey. We're just open-minded, which would be honestly super fair if they're actually going to have a quarterback competition. But Let do you believe out. at the end of the day, Grant, that he, that Ian Rappaport totally just went half cocked off on his own no sources niners never said Ian anything Rappaport. and he just he just went with it i mean it would that be unprofessional would be, that would but be i don't know him. That would it would be, be unprofessional yeah. straight up it would be yep. unprofessional all right vita blue passed away mm. yesterday yeah vita blue you knew vita blue my dad knew vita blue um he I, he's not going to be doing a show with me tomorrow he's taking a week off so he called me today and said please talk to larry about vita blue uh, people my dad's generation absolutely love. I didn't see him play, but I'm looking at his numbers, and the guy was like 21 with a 1.8 ERA. Like, he was a phenom. Please tell people what they needed to know about Vida. Uh, just, I mean, first of all, such a cool guy. I can't tell you the number of times he played. I mean, he and I played golf, and just he's telling stories. I mean, um, he's from pride of Mansfield, Louisiana. He played football and baseball. He was an incredible phenom athlete drafted by Charlie Finley in the Kansas City A's in the 67 amateur draft. I think in the second round, he went to DeSoto High School and then in Louisiana and in Mansfield. And uh, I asked him stupidly one time, how come you didn't decide to go play at LSU? And I was like, 
dumbass. Dude. He couldn't. He didn't, they didn't let him play at LSU. And he's oh, like, well, wow. I wanted to play at LSU, but they it was my my dream to play at LSU. You know, it was like, wow. They wouldn't they wouldn't let me. So I'm like, man, I'm sorry. good going I'm LSU. Stupid. Yeah, I mean seriously. I mean that just shows the ignorance nice. of the time. But um, came up in '69 at the end of the year as a 19 year old. Uh, pitched in 70, made six starts in 70, but 71 was his bust out year. Now I was one, so I, I'm not going to sit okay. here and tell you I remember. Okay, okay, okay. 24 and eight, 182 ERA, 24 complete games, eight shutouts, 312 innings, 209 hits in those innings. Just an unbelievable. He was the MVP of the league. He was the MVP and the Cy Young Award. He won the Cy what? Young Award and the MVP. That's got to be one of the greatest and seasons the a, a pitcher's game. ever had, especially a 21-year-old pitcher. Yeah. Whoa. Started the se- I talked to him many times when we played golf about the 71 All-Star game because he faced a lineup that had Mays and Aaron, and he got Mays to ground out, and Mays was his hero. And he was That's like, cool. Krug, man, I just retired my hero in the All-Star game. And that 71 All-Star game is one of the greatest sporting events of our lifetime. That was Reggie Jackson off the light tower at Ty- Tiger Stadium. That was mm. all kinds of stars. Um, it was it was an amazing point in baseball history, and he was right there. And then I remember him as an eight year old. He got traded to the Giants when Finley was just selling off all the pieces and just getting rid of everybody. And mm. finally, the Giants Vita was the last to go. He was part of a trade that Bowie Kuhn, um canceled and basically said, "No, you can't do it." So March, middle of spring training in 78, Giants traded for him for just a bunch of guys. I mean, Gary, Dave Haverlo and Gary Alexander and Gary Thomason and John Henry Johnson and all these, all these guys went to the A's for Vida and Vida comes to the Giants in 78, became the ace of the staff, wins 18 games, leads the Giants to this unbelievable resurgent season. They, their four starters were on the cover of the Sporting News at the time, which mm. was a big deal. Um, Vida, Nepper, um, I'm trying to think who else was in that. John Montefusco, Jim Barr. Um, and Vida, you know, was had, had this love affair with the fans, and the fans loved him. Um, and, and just, you know, over the last, you know, his post-career, he's done tons to support the Northern Lights School in Oakland, which oh. is a phenomenal school. And I know what that's cool is. Yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've been playing in the golf tournament for Northern Lights School every year. Um, Vita would invite me and his lovely wife, Michelle, and they would host this thing in, in the East Bay at, the, at a country club. And one time it's me and Vita and George Zimmer from the men's warehouse playing. And Vita was just, Vita, I remember one time I had, I'm playing golf with them, Grant, and we're like on the 16th hole or some some in this country club and I get this, the ball sandwich between like three trees and I'm like, Oh, cry. And I start, I start complaining and Vita's Vita's a great golfer. He's like, Krug, man, you got to have the trick shot. He's like, you want me to shoot that for you? And I'm like, yeah, Vita, please do. And he shot this ball through five trees and got it right up on the lip of the green. And he, and he's like, and he, he knew it was an epic shot. But he's tried to play it off like, yeah, man, I had it all the way. You know, it's like, I, you know, he was just cool. He was cool. He was easy to talk to. He was humble. He was uh, he was fair minded. He was optimistic. He was enthusiastic. You know, so many of the things you tell your kids to try to be in life. Vita was those things. And he had his own hurdles with substance and he had his own challenges throughout life. But you know what? He never was negative or um, bitter about opportunities that didn't come his way. He wasn't bitter about anything. He just, he was a guy, he loved people. He loved to tell stories. He loved to be around people. Um, I can imagine, I can picture your dad and him having some incredible conversations through the years. He was just, a well, he was a very my cool dad, guy, man. Very cool. My dad wanted to tell a story on his behalf, uh, a Vita Blue story, and he wrote this story in his book "Gloves Off." If you if you want to, he read did a whole chapter of Vita, in a his whole book, chapter on he? Vita Blue. Yeah, yeah. So what happened was, I guess when Vita was with the Giants, and my dad was early in his 19, 1979, 1980, Vita Blue was takes my dad and says, "Hey, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta stand in against the Blue Blazer." I guess that's what he called his fastball. Apparently, he had some serious heat, so oh, he yeah. took my dad to the outfield at Candlestick, and put my dad next to the outfield wall and says, stand there. And then he walked out 60 feet and threw a fastball as hard as he could down the middle. And 
<laughs> my dad said it was terrifying and he never actually saw it. And then Vita Blue came over and said, okay, now you got to do it one more time. So they called it the Blue Blazer. I can, the, the, the fastest fastball I ever stood in again, against in high school was 85 and that was pretty terrifying. I can only imagine what a Vita Blue Blue Blazer was like. The other story my dad wanted to tell was that apparently when um, Vita was pretty young, I guess he was with the Giants and Frank Robinson was the manager. And so they were on the road and Vita Blue had some laundry, some dry cleaning, and he wanted to go into the hotel, the team hotel, and just get a drink at the bar. But apparently those hotel bars are just for the coaches and the players are either supposed to pretend like they're not drinking or they're supposed to go somewhere else. So uh, Frank Robinson came over to and said, uh, Vita, get the hell out of here, dude. It's pretty funny. <laughs> I was like, sure, okay. I, I had a great, I'm playing golf with Vita and he, he goes, he goes, Krug, I ever tell you about the 74 series? And I'm like, no, tell me Vita. I was only four. And he's like, <laughs> he's like, we're getting ready to take the field at Dodger stadium against the Dodgers and the Dodgers. They had written some story that like every guy on the Dodger, like the A's didn't have any guy on the team that could make the Dodgers starting lineup. And at that point, Grant, the A's were the two time defending world series champions and the Dodgers yeah. were the up and comer. So a lot of the A's Reggie and others took that, took a lot of, a lot of offense to that. But he said that he's in the clubhouse and he's getting ready to, uh, to walk out on the field. And he's like, Kenny Holtzman and you know, uh, um, blue moon Odom or whatever going at it and full on brawl in the clubhouse. We're like minutes away from the Anthem. <laughs> You know, to go out there for game one of the World Series at Dodger Stadium on this beautiful day in Southern California. And he's like, and we're we're, we're fighting it out. Um, that's the, the swing and A's of the early 70s, man. That's they, cool. you know, they fought together. They all hated Finley for being a gigantic cheap ass. But then they they were awesome. <laughs> they were incredible. And they went out there and beat the Dodgers. So were they so, like so the next time you say somebody says, you know, chemistry, chemistry, chemistry. I don't know. I don't know about that. You know, these guys were brawling and they still won the World Series three times in a row. Were they like the real life uh, inspiration for Major League? The movie? <laughs> yeah, probably. Probably. I mean, you know, I mean, it just kind of goes to show that talent, talent was what matters. And Charlie Finley was incredible at finding talent in the late 60s and early 70s. And the A's, yeah. the A's were incredible. And then it was kind of sad because by the mid 70s, they tore it all down and they had, they were drawn like, you know, like, 2000 3000 um yeah. and then just the like today family, yeah the Haas family <laughs> bought the team eventually and built it up and they were on yeah. top of the world in the late 80s but you know i mean um yeah he's like krug it was amazing uh, we're getting ready to go out there to stand on the on the, the sing the national anthem and play game one of the world series and guys are brawling in the clubhouse <laughs> would you keep it down <laughs> that, anyway vita blue rest in peace no question a lot of people loved you all day, every day. Kim says, Larry, I ain't scared of competition. It's just ridiculous how Sam was the worst than a square wheel. Then he comes here and reporters fans calling him the most talented Niners quarterback ever. Unbelievable. Oh, we didn't even talk yeah, that's about a, that. That's the other thing. Maddie's saying that. And that's, again, like, do you think Maddie just thought of that one morning? I was like, I'm going to say it out loud. Or do you think someone told him and he was like, well, if that, that guy's going to say it off the record. I, I could say it. Well, first of all, there have been, I mean, you know and I know, there have been how many practices – of Sam Darnold throwing since he was acquired. None. Zero? Yeah. Zero. So yeah. so what's that so, based on? Yeah. Where's that coming from? It ain't we yeah. know. I mean, by definition, unless Sam works out with Mayoko, we know that <laughs> that's just coming from somebody from within. But to me, it's even someone more who didn't want to put their name on someone who didn't want to attach their name to it. I'll tell you that. But wanted that out there. So there's there. I mean, I think that's an illustration that there are forces at work here to push Sam Darnold as a hey, viable it, the, me, to, the way it looks to me is that it's Not an even wife. race. It's an even race. Now, Trey, probably they hope Trey wins because they're more invested in Trey, but doesn't mean he has a leg up. And I think all they're saying is, Ian, stop saying Sam has a leg up. It's literally a fair comp. Uh, we need this to be a fair competition. That's the whole thing, right? If well, Trey's going to win this job, fair. he has to win it fair and square. I don't even think fair. I think it needs to be decisive. Otherwise, I think they need to go with Trey Lance. They either Trey Lance has to be treated like the incumbent here. Like fair. in the 70s, if you wanted to beat Ali, you had to beat Ali. Right. You know what I mean? You, didn't, right. you weren't just going to be handed a decision. 
And right. it, I don't think Niner fans are going to be satisfied if they if they both play kind of eh and it's Sam Darnold. I think they want to see Trey Lance. That's how I feel about this Warriors Lakers series for the first three games. I feel like Lakers won two decisions, games one and three. I'm like, can you stop giving them the game on points? Can they just play the damn game? Like it's basketball. No one's getting hurt. You don't have to call 50 million fouls, please. I know I, that has not been good, but I'll say this Steve Kerr, you got to bring Jonathan Kuminga along. He, you're just leaving him behind is not the answer. And they got to figure out what they're going to do with Jordan Poole. And it not looks playing. like Draymond Green is not nearly as ferocious or as intense as he was last round. Is that because he's going to be on the Lakers next year? He's too buddy buddy with LeBron and, and hmm. AD. He's pulling AD off the floor. He's chatting it up with LeBron. Where's the ferocious? green that is a key element of the warriors mm-hmm. and then the other factor is get steph curry the ball and we have all five guys work to get him open because he's yeah. 35 and yeah younger steph curry could get himself open but steph curry at 35 needs pick set he needs help and they need to figure out a way to spring him uh for some for some good looks in the first half of this game or they are going home i mean seriously yeah it, this they, they got to have this one tonight. I'm really not worried about the Warriors' offense. I think they're going to come out focused after a 20, 30 point loss. But I'm a little concerned about their defense. They got to make sure D'Angelo Russell never does that again. And to me, that means putting Wiggins on Russell because I don't think Clay's quick enough at 32 or whatever he is to stick with Russell. So Wiggins needs to go from guarding LeBron to Russell, and I think that means you got to put Draymond on LeBron, and I think that means you got to live with Anthony Davis scoring points. The thing with Anthony Davis is I don't think he wants to work that hard. I don't think he wants. I think tonight is a load management night. Does he load manage during games? It looks like he does. It, it, his production tells you he does. I just it's think amazing. He's, he's pretty banged up. I'll say this too: the Lakers don't have great three point shooters, but you can't just not uh, not pay any attention. Agreed. Because if you pay Reeves no will attention, Schroeder will, will hit that shot. Yep. Some of those guys will hit. Russell will and hit they that showed shot. them. They showed them in the yep. last game. If they leave those guys wide freaking open. That's yep. going to be a bad thing. You got to you got to make they got to play better defense. your defensive pressure. They got to play way better defense. Their defense in this last game was crap. One twenty seven. Okay. D'Angelo Russell twenty one points. Crap. Not good. enough. Well, I mean, they got up. Warriors got up eleven in the second quarter and just started throwing the ball away, and having fouling. all kinds of te- technical fouls. Yep. But they, there shouldn't be a forty dis, forty free throw disparity no. in the number of forty four free throws. Forty four. Yeah, forty four. Far and away the biggest of any playoff series in the NBA playoffs. So, I mean, happen. some of it's to be expected because of the styles these teams play, but that doesn't explain all. But what did you say about Ali in the 70s? If you wanted to beat Ali, you had to beat him. These are This is him. Ali. These are four-time champions they won last year. You can't take the title from them at the free throw line. It's, it's fraudulent. you got to play basketball at a certain point. Well, but the I other think that's thing what happens is, deeper in series. Steph Curry in 88 or 99 minutes has seven free throw attempts or seven free throws. Schroeder's got 18 free throws in 68 minutes. And you say, well, Steph settles for threes. Steph is actually driven to the bucket more than Schroeder. And he's not getting How many balls. players on the Lakers have shot more free throws than Steph in this series? Like six. I bet Reeves. I bet Reeves is one. I bet Russell's one. It's like, are you kidding me? You yeah, can't. Steph has got to get some calls here, but. But that's the that's the part I don't love about the NBA is I don't love the 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 whole calls and makeup calls and uh, me you know, too. It just me it too. Seems, Call it straight. It seems, Call it straight. Like, it, it I don't tune into the game. Do you tune into the Niners playoff games and go, "Who's the back judge?" Oh no, not at all. Not at no, all. I, not it at should all. play no factor. And you, we should NBA, not have to scout the freaking refs. Right. I don't want to know his strengths and weaknesses and tendencies. I don't want to. I don't want to know his name. Right. I don't want to know his name. Sorry. Good call. All right, well, game starts in three hours. I'm going to do a post-game reaction. You're probably going to do a post-game show. Yeah, yeah. So check us out. Check us both out. Hell yeah. Enjoy the game. Thanks for watching. See you guys later.